You might take the Word of God this morning. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We read verses 13 through verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That's right after 1 Corinthians. <laughs> About the best I got. <laughs> that's all I took, I know. That's what I have. That's all I can do for you. Amen. Chapter 5, 2 Corinthians. Beginning in verse 13. This is the Apostle Paul here, writing to the church of Corinth. He says, For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, now we know man, after, know, we know man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no. More. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. And old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank You for Your word this morning. God, I pray You would blow through this place with your sweet spirit this morning. And we just pray, Holy Spirit, that you move in hearts and lives, Lord Father. And I pray you just put a hedge around us for the next little bit, Lord. Guard our hearts and minds that your word might go forth, Lord Father. And Father, we're looking for something supernatural uh, this morning, for you to do something that uh, we've never seen before. That you to do something when we leave this place, we can say that it had to have been you, Lord Father. And only you could have done that. And so God, I just pray you preach me this morning. You give me unction, Lord Father, that you'd anoint me. God, I pray my, uh, on my own part that I would just empty myself, Lord God, that you might fill me. And God, I just pray, Lord, that if there's one lost, Lord Father, out there this morning, Lord God, in the sign of my voice, Lord Father, that you'd save me. And so God, we just thank you for what you're going to do. And we ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Everything in our text this morning is dependent upon those two words in verse 17. In Christ. In Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. And old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. To be in Christ, it would, for us, uh, it would mean to be born again. Not of the flesh, but of the Spirit. It's a new creation, not by the will of man, but by the will of God. It's impossible for man uh, to experience his supernatural birth on his own. He needs a working and moving of God's Word and, and God's power through His Holy Spirit. And by faith, we simply believe in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. That he died. That he was buried. And three days later, He rose again. That He's exalted and sits by the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for you and I. John chapter 1 says, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It's a supernatural act to be born again. And you must be born again if you're to see heaven, if you're to enter into the kingdom of God. If you're ever to have a relationship with your heavenly Father, it has to be through Jesus Christ and the power of His Gospel. That whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. 
For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that uh, the world through Him might be saved. That's what it means to be in Christ. Uh, an analogy of that, an illustration of that, Paul uh, is using that word in Christ, and I believe he's using that from an Old Testament reference uh, back in the book of Genesis to explain what he's talking about here. And it's a great analogy. You remember this story. We've all heard it. Uh, even those that might not be saved, even those that don't go to church a whole lot or really even know the Bible, they know the story of Noah. And they know the story of the ark. In Genesis chapter 7, verse 1 says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou in thy house into the ark. For thee uh, I have I seen righteous before me in this generation. And so Noah went in the ark. Okay? I'm going to read on. Verse 7 in that same chapter says, And Noah went in, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Genesis 7, 16 says, And they went, and they that went in went in male and female of all flesh as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The picture here is Jesus Christ as the ark there in Genesis chapter 7. And we go into Christ. And when we're in Christ, if you remember, Noah and his family went in there, and God sent a great judgment on all creation. He sent a great judgment on sin. And it began to rain and the waves and the storms begin to beat, but there was no one and his family inside the ark, just as I'm inside Christ, and not a drop of rain ever touched us. Right. The water came, the storms came, and they beat upon the ark. They, they beat, and, and the judgment of that water was placed on that ark, and yet inside the ark was Noah safe and sound. You see, when Christ was on the cross of Calvary, Christ took every bit of judgment that was placed on you, He took it on Himself. Right. Listen, He took the wrath of an almighty God against sin and took the, your sin and my sin, placed them on His shoulders. They were nailed to a cross. And when God's wrath that was meant for me uh, should have been on me and I should have been in hell and I should have suffered that, Christ, out of His love, suffered that for me. And that's what the ark was. And God placed judgment on His creation, and He said, I'm going to unleash all my wrath on this ark. But who's ever in the ark is going to be shut in, and not a drop of water is going to touch them. Not a drop of judgment is ever going to touch me. Not a sin. When I stand before my Heavenly Father at that great day and He looks at me as filthy and, and dirty and as unrighteous as I am and deserving of hell, He's going to look over and at the ark, my ark, my shelter in the time of the storm, Jesus Christ, and He's going to say, you're fine. You're righteous. You're clean. Not because of what I've done, but because of what Christ has done for me. And by faith, I have received that. You ever thought about the ark? Because judgment went against this world and against that ark that was in that flood, when judgment stopped, everything in Noah's past was gone. Amen. <laughs> Somebody should have said amen on that one. Listen, everything in my past wiped away. Gone in the judgment of my sin and my unrighteousness and my unholiness is all gone. It's been wiped away because the wrath of God was put on Jesus Christ and He took everything for me. And now, everything in the past is gone. Notice that verse said, and everything's become new. That's in the present active indicative. You know what? I haven't talked to that in English. That means it's always going on. It's forever becoming new. All my sins washed away. All uh, my unrighteousness. I'm clean now. And Noah got in that ark and God shut him in. And not only was his past wiped away, did you know the ark landed and come to rest in an exalted position? Right on top of a mountain. You know, I've been exalted to a position that I don't deserve. That I was not responsible for getting me there. The ark was 
tossing this way and that way. Moses was not the captain of that ship. He had nothing to do with selling it. He had nothing to do with where it went. But when the judgment was over, the ark found its way in an exalted position on top of a mountain. And when the door opened, whoa! Noah and his family walked out. You know what they walked out into? Newness of life. Amen. Everything gone and all things have become new. Amen. All creation destroyed. And they became uh, new residents of another country. Right. Of another country. Are you in Christ this morning? Because you're not. One day, when you leave this world, you draw your last breath. Uh, when you close your eyes for the last time, if, if, if you've not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then you will stand and receive the wrath and judgment of an almighty, holy God. And because He was in Christ, that changed everything about His life. It changed not only everything about His life, but if you'll notice in verse 3, 13, it changed people's perception of Him. Do you notice that? It says, For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be so. The phrase there, beside ourselves, means, according to one translation there, it means to go beyond all reasonable boundaries. In other words, He was going past what the norm was. Did you know being a Christian... That kind of makes you an odd person. Yeah. The Bible says it makes you a peculiar person. Yeah. Isn't that what it is? And you know, uh, they saw Paul, they said, listen, this was a man that was a Pharisee of the Pharisee. A Hebrew of the Hebrew. He was being groomed for the top spot on the Sanhedrin. He was somebody. And all of a sudden, he has given all that up. And people said, you know what? Uh, he's a little beside himself. You ever heard that saying? He's got a, a screw or two loose. <laughs> He's a few bricks short of a load. Yeah. You can probably go on with that, right? Yeah. I mean, you're acting... Listen, what they were saying was that after they saw Paul, and they said, you're just taking this Jesus thing just a little too far. You're being a little extreme for us. You're going past the normal boundaries. You're acting a little crazy. You're acting a little fanatical. You see, it's, it's, it's like the, the guy that goes to all the games and, and he goes and he watches his favorite team and he's got his favorite player's jersey on. You ever seen that guy? You ever went to a game with that guy? Jay, you know what I'm talking about. Don't you? <laughs> There's that guy. I mean, he's got the whole gear. And man, he's a fan. Okay? He's a fan. Ain't no doubt about it. But then there's that guy that if you've ever been to a game and had to sit beside that guy, he comes and he has no shirt on at all. But he's tucking the team colors and he's painted himself. In other words, he's gone past something that's normal. He's gone into just crazy. Okay? And that's what they were saying about Paul. Paul was telling them all kinds of stuff they just couldn't get a hold of. Paul said, listen, if you want to get full, you need to get empty. They said, what? He said, listen, if you'll confess your wrongs, God will make you right. Amen. He said, if you'll kneel down, God will lift you up. They said, that just don't make no sense. He said, if you'll become as weak as water, God will make you strong. I just can't get a hold of that. If you'll become poor as dirt, God will make you rich and store up treasures in heaven on your behalf. Amen. If you'll die to yourself, You'll be more alive than you've ever been. Hey. If you'll suffer, then God will give you joy. And I said, we just can't get a hold of what you're saying. You are acting crazy. <laughs> but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness mm -hmm. unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Chris, that's why we need the Holy Spirit in here this morning. Amen. To reveal these things to us. People look at him different after he got saved. People look at you different after you've been saved. I mean, you got a Sunday, you, a Monday, you. You know that kind of person, right? You ain't never been that kind of person, but you might know somebody like that. I mean, there's Sunday me, and then there's Monday me. Uh, there's my Sunday talk, 
And then there's my Monday talk. There's my, I'm preaching that. There's my Sunday walk. And then there's my Monday walk. And I'm separating. I keep them separate. You know that person? You know what I'm talking about. What do people say about you? What do people say about me? Are you crazy? Or Jesus? Are you a little peculiar? You won't do the things that the other people will do? You won't participate in what the world's participating in? And they laugh and they mock at us and they think we're strange. <coughs> they said, Paul, you're just strange. We just, you're just strange. Not only was that perception of him changed, but also I got a new motivation in my life. Verse 14 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. In other words, he said, I'm motivated, I'm driven, I have a new purpose in life because of God's love for me. Do you know God's love is the greatest? In the thing in the world. It's the thing that motivates us. Not that we loved Him first, but that He loved us. Yes. While I was yet a sinner, He loved me. And because of His love for me, it's not my love for Him. Listen, if you're comparing your love for Him to His love for you, you're mistaken this morning. Yes. That don't balance out. Right. That's not even close. You see, He loves the unloved. He loves you when you're dirty and filthy. He loves you when you're clean and up high on the mountain and living for Him. He just loves you. Not because of anything you've done, but because of His great love and His great mercy. And Paul said, because of what He's done for me, that love has constrained me. In other words, it means to get a hold of something. It means that His love is pressing in on me from the north, south, the east, and west. And Paul said, He's got a hold on my life and I'm never going to be the same because His love moves me to action. Did you know why you're disobedient to Him? You all know that, don't you? Because you don't love Him. And then what did He say? He said, if you love me, you'll keep my... <laughs> Boy, that hurts, doesn't it? Hey, you're unfaithful to Him. You know what it says? That You know what you're telling Him? You can say, Lord, I love you. You're the greatest. You're, my, you're the catch me out. You're, you're everything to me. But you're unfaithful. You aren't obeying His commandments. You know what you're telling Him? I don't love you. But, but, he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Paul said, I love Him. And what He's done for me. Look at His love there. Romans, Paul said, 8, 35 through 37, He said, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Our tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. But nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. His love has given me the victory. 1 John 4, 9. And this was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Here in His love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sin. In fact, the love of God constrained Him so much and gave Him a new motivation that He only, not only had a perception, uh, other people's perception of Him, but His perception of other people had changed. Hadn't he? You notice what He said there. Wherefore, henceforth, verse 16, that means from now on, know we no man after the flesh. He said, you know, I used to look at men because I was a Pharisee and I was somebody. I was a preacher. I was very religious. And I stuck my nose up at other people. And, and I looked at them through my uh, eyes instead of through my spirit. And when I come to somebody, it was me that judged whether he was worthy to be saved or not. It was me that judged him whether uh, he was able to come into the house of God. It, I did all that. He said, you know, I don't look at people like that anymore. I look at whosoever will come. Whosoever's thirsty, let him come and drink of the river of life freely. He said, it changed my outlook how I look at things. I don't look at the temporal. I'm looking at the eternal. I'm not worried uh, about what's going on here. I'm not wringing my hands. I've got one sole purpose in my life that constrains me, and that's the love of my Savior, Jesus Christ. And He said, the greatest commandments, which everything else hangs on, is to love Him 
and love my neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Love your neighbor. Well, you don't know my neighbor. <laughs> I said that for you so you wouldn't have to say it. <laughs> you don't say that. I don't love my neighbor. My neighbor. Oof, you just don't know my neighbor, preacher. Yeah, don't tell me about your neighbor. Tell God about your neighbor. Who do you love? Who do you don't love? Oh, I can't. Man, that person's a, look at that drug addict. I can't love that. That person, oh, that's despicable. God loves them. It's hard. Homosexual, God loves them. Sorry. I'm just sorry. Hey, I didn't write it, folks. I'm just a messenger. He had a different perception on others. But not only that, he had, uh, Paul tells us he had a new occupation, didn't he? St. Corinthians 5, 18 says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given up to us the ministry of reconciliation. Boy, he said, I've got a new ministry in my life. He said, not only is it my ministry, but it's your ministry. People ask me, what can I do? I, Listen, you've got a ministry, friend. It's not, my, it's not just my ministry as a pastor. It's not just a deacon's ministry. It's, not, it's your ministry, a ministry of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. You know, as Christ is, so are we in this world. In other words, Christ is ascended back up. He said, I was the light of the world. He said, now you're the light of the world. He said, you're going to be my hands, my mouthpiece, my feet. And you're going to have a ministry of reconciliation. Right. You're going to go and carry out the Great Commission, the good news uh, of a risen Savior. And that's your ministry. Reconciliation there, it means to bring into perfect harmony and unity. And I mean, it's, a, it's, it's, it's justification on steroids is what it is. You know, justification, you're pronounced innocent. You're pronounced righteous before God. But this goes one step further. Dr. Ironside uh, wrote this about it. He said, It is not only that our sins are forgiven and that divine justice has nothing against us, but it is that He has received us as His own to His loving heart. And we are reconciled to God and we joy in Him. Not only has He forgiven me, but I have <laughs> fellowship with Him. And better than that, I have God's favor on me. You might not think so by looking at me. But I have God's favor on me. That's a joke. <laughs> I really do. God uh, thinks something of me. He, he thinks I'm, I'm special. He thinks I'm somebody. He loves me uh, with an everlasting love. Uh, a good illustration of that is in the Gospel of Luke. You remember the, the prodigal son? You remember that? He got out of his mind. and Oh, he turned on his father. How he treated his father like dirt. Uh, how he thought of his inheritance and then just trampled under the grace of His loving Father and all that His Father had done. And, and the Bible picks up the story there uh, about Him after He had spent all His money and had all His fun and, and, and nothing was left for Him. And He arose up and He came to His Father. After all that He had done, He rose up and came back to His Father. But when He was yet a great way off, His Father saw Him and had compassion and ran and fell on His neck and kissed Him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe. He said, Put on him. Listen, put on him. Go, go get my ring. And go get my shoes. And, and go get the fatted calf. And all those things spoke of not just being forgiven, but being in the favor of the one that he had trampled underfoot. Being in favor of the one that he had sinned so mightily against. Uh, but listen, before he ever listen, before he ever saw the Father, the Father was running to him to embrace him and love him. And he said, I just want to be a servant. I'll just be a slave. I'll just be a nobody. Just take me back in. He said, no, no. He said, you, you're not just a servant. He said, listen, everything that I am, you are. He threw that robe on. He said, all my righteousness, all my goodness, right here, just put it on me. He said, he took off his ring. He said, you know, this, this, this speaks of my power and my authority. He said, that's what you've got. 
all the promises, all my authority. Just put that on your son. He said, look at these shoes. Listen, he said, just put those shoes on, and those shoes of peace and walk with me and talk with me along life's way. And listen, when, we're, when if that wasn't good enough, he said, go get supper ready because he's coming and sitting at the table where he's going to feast on the fatted calf. That talks about that fellowship forevermore. Amen. That's what reconciliation is. And we have a ministry of reconciliation. Who are you telling about Jesus? What kind of ambassador are you being for Jesus Christ? Amen. You ever thought about an ambassador? The ambassador serves at the pleasure of another. You know that? An ambassador, listen, he can't appoint himself an ambassador. He has to be made an ambassador. You think about an ambassador today, we send him all over the country, but he doesn't represent himself, but rather he represents the one that sent him. He doesn't speak his own message, but he speaks to whatever uh, the one that told him and what to speak, whoever sent him. He's got that message. The ambassador, he doesn't operate in his own country, he operates in another country. Amen. And you know, when he's in that other country, when he's in that foreign country, he stays in a place called an embassy. In other words, he's in a foreign country, uh, but he's got a place of refuge to go into. He's got four walls around that he can go into and operate. He's got four walls. And listen, when he's in that embassy, you know what it's like? It's like that he is stepping into his home country. Do you know wherever our embassies are? That's, that's our ground there is United States ground right there. And he steps back into his country. He lives in a protected place wherever he goes. Somebody said the embassy was a home, away from home, until you get home. You didn't get that, did you? Yeah, yeah. Mm -mm -mm. What kind of ambassador are you being for what he's done for you? How much do you say you love him, but your walk doesn't line up with that? What is constraining you? This morning, what has a hold on you this morning? More than anything else. Let's stand, if you would. Grab your hymn books, if you would. Turn to page 821. Number 821. Grace that is greater. He's wiped out your past. Are you in Christ this morning? Are you in the ark? Have you got a new outlook? Have you got a new occupation this morning? You need to be in Christ. That's the key to it. How are you doing this morning? Grace that is greater than all ours. Listen, He's got grace enough for you this morning. Listen, maybe you need to just come and say, you know what? I'm just not doing, I'm not just being an ambassador. I'm not, I'm not representing like I need to represent. I'm not possessed. I'm not constrained by His love like I want to be. Lord, would You just love on me this morning? Would You just help me this morning? Maybe you say, you know what? I, well, my past is dogging me out. I just can't get over my past. It's just dogging me out. Every, every day, it creeps up behind me. You know what you need to do? You need to get in the ark. And let that judgment just sweep all that stuff away. That's old stuff. Everything's become new. Don't live in the past. You can never go forward looking back. You can never grow, grab a hold of the gospel plow and plow straight if you're looking back. Maybe you just need somebody to listen. Create in me a new heart. A life made over. That's what He wants to do for you. Come on, we're going to say another verse. Maybe you just need to come deal with God. You come. Let me share Jesus Christ with you. Maybe you just need Jesus this morning. You come. As God's dealing with these folks. Get in the ark this morning. Get in the ark this morning. There's a storm out there brewing. There's a storm out there brewing ready to come. Might not be today. Might not be tomorrow. But you know there's a storm coming. Get in the ark of safety this morning. For every provision, every need is made. You come. There's more grace to be given than you need. It's a wonderful say. Listen to this song.
place off from there. We'll close out. We'll drag this on. We need Jesus. Why don't you come? We just thank you for being here. We love you. Thank you for worshiping with us in spirit and truth. We have a sweet spirit in this place this morning. It's just been a sweet spirit all week everywhere I've been. It's just been a sweet spirit. Touching hearts, moving in lines. Taking sorrow and turning it into joy. Taking death and giving life. That's what He does, friend. That's what He does. He's a wonderful Savior. He's a wonderful Savior. Amen. Amen. All hearts clear. Amen. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank y'all for being with us. Been a tough couple of weeks here at the church. We lost some folks. We had some tragedies and stuff. Well, I'm glad. Uh, it's good to be in the ark. Yeah. It's good to be in the ark. He's a wonderful Savior. I'm going to ask Brother Donnie O'Quinn if he closes in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we truly thank you, Lord, for the word that you brought to us, Lord. We the word of God, Lord. We thank you for your good grace to us, Lord. We love your kindness towards us, Lord. We just thank you for all you do for us, Lord. We just ask you to do with all the prayer request has been made this morning that uh, you deal with each and every one according to what your will might be with them. Bless us as we go our separate ways. Give us safety to our homes. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.